passage this morning where Paul says, Therefore, we are always confident. Always confident. The word confident means courageous, hopeful. And in Hebrews 13, it's translated bold. That we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Paul says he's always confident. We know the context here is Paul has been enduring great affliction and suffering in ministry. It's been of great sacrifice to him. He would say in chapter 4, always bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh or bodies. And Paul's body was perishing. The outward man was perishing. Paul's body was being pummeled. Paul's body was being afflicted. Paul's body was being subjected to great danger, not just of being injured. He was being subjected to the danger of death every day of his life in ministry. Now, his critics and enemies, the false apostles, who had an overrealized eschatology that says, as a Christian, you should be living like a king now, they could not equate suffering with apostleship, and they used that to criticize Paul. He said, why is this man suffering so much as an apostle? Is he really an apostle? And they thought he was like a madman. That's why in verse 13, Paul says, for whether we be beside ourselves like a madman, it is of God. So Paul is answering his critics as to why daily, not occasionally, but daily, he's subjected to danger, and yet he just keeps going. So he's answering the critics. He's instructing the church at Corinth who are taking sides, at least some of them still, with these false brethren. And Paul says, we are always confident knowing that. So this title has three subsections to it. One, Paul's confidence is in knowing what lies ahead. Two, Paul's confidence is in knowing that God has wrought him and us for this selfsame thing. And then the third is a conclusion. Wherefore, in verse 9, we labor. So you can see, when we have this confidence of Paul, and we can have it today, the result, the consequence is, in affliction, Paul keeps laboring, whether present or absent in relation to the Lord. He He wants to be accepted of God. That's his aim. So the glory of God is his aim, and this confidence, this courageous boldness, this hope that Paul has is in knowing in these three ways. So the first thing we look at in Paul's confidence in what lies ahead is death itself. Paul is going to look at three Christian experiences that we will have as it relates to death concerning his relationship to Jesus Christ. And he will use a mixture of metaphors, one, a house, a building, that he refers to as his body, if the earthly house of our tabernacle or tent is dissolved. We have a building, a house of God, not made with hands, eternal. So first he speaks of his body as as a house you live in, and that's what this body of clay is. The real you is inside of you. This is just a shell, it's a house, That holds the soul. Secondly, he will talk of the body as clothing. Not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. That immortality might be swallowed up of life. So under this section where Paul's confidence in what lies before him. It's not that he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He doesn't know if persecution is going to end his life the next day. But he does know what lies before as it relates to his death. So these three ways of of looking at it, Paul says, first of all, when we're still at home in the house and in our clothing, then we're absent from the Lord, we walk by faith. So Paul's confidence as he looks to the future is he's walking by faith, not by sight. Secondly, Paul is willing rather, and these are in ascending order, faith is good, faith is how we should walk, but there's something better. To be absent from the tent, the body, the house, the clothing is to be present with the Lord. He's confident that when his tent goes into the ground, his disembodied soul goes to be with Christ. What are the implications of that? And then thirdly, the ultimate preference 
Paul is not saying a walk of faith is bad. He's saying it's least in terms of the preference of being present with the Lord and without the body, but the greatest is to be clothed with a new house that God has prepared for us, for the Christian. And so this is why Paul is confident, always ministering and laboring, because he knows when he looks to the future by the walk of faith, he sees his experience in these three ways. So first look, Paul is confident because he knows what lies ahead by faith. And this is what he says in verse 6. Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, in the clothing, in the house, in the tent, we are absent from the Lord. We're still here. Now that's where you are today if you're a Christian. Parenthesis, because we walk by faith and not by sight. Now this connects us with the previous chapter. Paul has said he, his light afflictions, which are but for a moment, is working for him a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While he looks, not at the things which can be seen, but the things which are not seen. How do you look at things which you cannot see? We walk by faith. So what Paul is saying in chapter 4 is getting us to chapter 5. This walk of faith is how Paul knows and sees and looks at eternal things through the Word of God. This is not a leap in the dark. He leaps squarely upon the foundation of God's Word and he knows without doubt, by faith, what his future holds for Paul. Now Paul would say this in Philippians 1, 21 and 22, where he's going to connect his view of death by faith with what it means in labor. See, the reality is, beloved, when we have this confidence, we look to the future, it frees us for a life of service. If we lose this confidence, what happens? We live for today. We live for the vapor. We live for this momentary existence because we're not looking by faith with a confidence of what lies before us. So Philippians 1 says this, for, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Paul is in prison. He doesn't know if tomorrow will bring death or continue to life. But if he does live tomorrow while he's in prison, what will he do? He will labor. This is fruitful labor. That's what it means to me to live. How does he have this confidence to labor? Because death is is what? Gain. He looks by the eye of faith to the future and he knows death is not the end. Death will usher Paul into great gain. And so what does he do when he has this confidence by faith? He labors, he serves, he ministers in affliction, in danger, in hardship, in trouble, in perplexities, in persecution, and in being cast down. We learned in chapter 4. His confidence is a life of faith that looks to the future and says, I know, I know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle is demolished, Paul says, I have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Therefore, with this confidence, Paul says, that's why I'm laboring with danger every day of my life. Do you have this confidence? Are you looking at the future with such a confidence that it frees your hands and your feet and your body, this clothing and this house that you live in that is being dissolved and decaying for a life of service to Jesus Christ? Now this is very critical because if we're gripped with the fear of death and we look to the future, then we live for the bubble of today. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews makes this point as we're considering. The walk of faith, looking at the grave and beyond, means Paul labors and we can too. If we look away from eternity and start looking at temporal things, then affliction is heavy, it lasts forever, and we do everything to avoid it, which for Paul means what? I'm not writing these letters anymore. I'm not going to Corinth. I'm not traveling the world because all it means is heavy affliction that seems to last a lifetime. So this confidence beyond the grave is critical for us to release us for what God has called us to, a life of service 
in the kingdom of God. Listen to Hebrews 2 and about the 12th verse. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That's Christ. That through death. All right, so Jesus took part of the same of flesh and blood as the children. The previous verse says, Behold, I am the children which God has given me. For as much then. So Christ gladly takes on a body. Christ, who is God, who didn't lay aside His deity, takes on flesh and blood. Why? Because the children have flesh and blood. And because Jesus needs to die to accomplish something. Through death, Jesus is going to accomplish two things. That's why He needed a body. God can't die. But a human body can be laid down in death. That through death, Number one, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Number two, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to slavery. All right, how did Jesus destroy the devil? Of course, he's still alive and remains. The word means to render powerless. What was the devil's one power over you? One thing, as the diabolos, the accuser of the brethren, it's your sin. In the courtroom of God's justice, all he has to do is say, that man's a sinner, that woman's a sinner, and here's what they've done. And you're gone and dead with an eternal death and wrath forever. But through Christ, his death, he stripped the devil of his arsenal of one thing unforgiven sin, and he's brought justification to Christ's people, to his own people. For who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. The devil cannot bring a charge against you, not now, not in the past, nor in the future. Why? Because you've been declared righteous before God. Let the righteousness of God be the flame that burns within the church, the imputed righteousness that Christ has brought to us by faith through death. He's been stripped. But here's the second thing that relates to our text. And to deliver you, the devil's power has been stripped, the power of unforgiven sins through Christ, and we've been delivered, who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. How is it that all of humanity is enslaved to the fear of death. It's not that they don't understand and know that they'll die. I mean, there's countless witnesses to that every day and throughout all of past history that there's a 100% death rate. Every single person dies. So it's not that they, they're, they're gripped with fear, or we were, that, that we didn't think we were going to die. No, we know that. It's not that you meet people that are unbelievers and every day they're gripped with a constant fear, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. We don't see that. What is it? When you're afraid of something, when you fear something, what do you do? You stay away from it. When you fear heights like I do, you, you don't get up on tall buildings and lean over and look, at the, look, look over the side. If you fear spiders, aside from for screaming, you stay away from spiders. And if you fear death, what do you do? You stay away from death. I don't mean staying away from dying. I mean staying away from the reality of what happens after death. See, when you're gripped with the fear of death, you don't think about it. You ignore it. You go to a funeral and you may think about it for a few minutes. And then when you leave, you don't give any thought. What happened to that person? Where are they? Is that the end? You just go on and forget about it. Jesus delivered us from the fear of death to unleash us for the service of God because now we know what lies before us. We can face the monster death and smile. And if you can't, then you're going to be gripped with a fear that never thinks about your mortality. I mean, you don't ever think about it. And then how do you live? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. We don't know what's going on there. We don't know what happens after death. So we live in the vapor. We put all our resources, our time, our effort to a two-second breath on a winter day. But if you can look at the monster death like Paul did, and you're confident knowing that to be 
at home in the body is to be absent from the Lord because you're walking by faith and you know what the future holds, then how does the Christian live? We let food and drink and kindred and possessions go because we know that after death, we live forever. Life awaits us after death. So Jesus has disarmed the devil. He's removed the fear of death from us so that we're not ignoring the reality of what is happening. Paul is squarely looking ahead by faith and saying, I know that when my earthly house goes down, I have a building of God, therefore I labor and I labor and I labor because the best life is not now. It's coming. And if we can't look with that look of hope, it's going to affect how we hold on to things and how we serve one another in the kingdom. Now think about this in relation to the very definition of faith, that faith is always forward-looking, according to Hebrews 11.1 1, that was read this morning. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when you have faith that's working itself out in love, you're hoping for something. By definition, you're looking to what lies ahead. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Where is Paul looking? He's looking not at things which are seen, but things which are unseen. He's not looking at things that are temporal. He's looking at things eternal. And that's what faith does. It's the evidence, it's the proof of what you cannot see. So faith, in some way, is going to give demonstration, and evidence, and proof of what you're hoping in and what you cannot see. Now, how does that work? Because that's what's working for Paul in chapter 5 of our text. That's why he's confident in the future. That's why his faith is working. The word substance has three nuances, and they're all three contained in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 3.14, and Hebrews 11.1. 1. I want to put them all three together to show you kind of what this substance is. First, substance, the nuance there is, is something solid, firm, foundation-like, like a substructure under a building that's below the ground. It's solid. So faith is, is solid foundation-like when you're hoping in things in the future. And that's what the writer is trying to get his audience to do. Be solid, be foundation-like, because faith is going to keep going, keep laboring, keep pressing on in affliction, in reproaches, and what they were experiencing. When? When faith is solid because it's hoping in something in the future. Faith knows what lies ahead, so faith is substance-like. Second nuance. A little easier to see is Hebrews 3.14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence. Hypostasis, that's the same word as substance. Confidence and assurance steadfast to the end. Now that's a little easier to see, right? Faith is the confidence and the assurance of what we're hoping in. Then faith does what? Gives proof of what you're looking at that you can't see. It'll give proof in your life. So confidence and assurance, and that's Paul's word, not the same word. Courage, hopeful. Paul is always confident because by faith, he's hoping in what's beyond the grave. And therefore, the evidence of his hope is what? Wherefore, we labor. Stop looking at eternal things, what happens? I'm not laboring. I'm just too tired. It's just too hard. It's too heavy. It's too long. And it's not light. And those are all the opposite words that we know Paul uses in chapter 4. So substance, solid foundation of what we hope for. It's the confidence, it's the assurance of what we're looking to and hoping in. And then thirdly, Hebrews 1.3. Speaking of Christ, who's the heir of all things, by Him the worlds were made, He being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His hypostasis, same word, person. Different nuance there. The word person there means nature. It's the basic or inherent feature of something. So Christ is the exact copy of God's person. So what is it about Christ that has the basic and inherent features of God? Well, He's eternal. He's sovereign. He's perfect. He's righteousness. In other words, He's what? He's God. He is God. All right, now put that word in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the basic inherent feature of what you're hoping for. There's an element 
There's a nature, there's an essence, which is what the word also means in Hebrews 1.3. Faith is the essence, it's the basic, indispensable quality of what you're hoping for. And what are you hoping for? Well, the resurrection of the body, that's what Paul is talking about. The, the new clothing, the new building, yes. Heaven, heaven, we're waiting for heaven. But what is the basic inherent quality or feature of heaven? It's joy. Hebrews 12, 2. Who for the joy set before him endured. And Jesus kept what? Laboring and serving you. So this solid foundational substance that's a confident assurance of things hoped for in faith is a joy that Paul has when he looks to the future and he sees what's coming. Now we learn this in chapter 1 where Paul said, not that we have dominion over your faith, but we're helpers of your joy because by faith you stand. And if you remember, we said the essence of faith, the basic or inherent feature of faith is joy. That's why Paul used it interchangeably. So this confidence that Paul has when he looks to the future, this essence of faith that Paul has and that we have when we look to the future is an essence of joy. In other words, we've tasted the heavenly gift and we've tasted the good word of God and we've tasted the power of the world to come. Faith is a taste. We haven't gulped it down yet. Mortality hasn't been swallowed up of life, but we've tasted it. What's to come? So when faith is confident and assured, when faith is tasting the world to come, the evidence of that faith that cannot be seen or that hope is what? Service. Now your hands are free, like Paul's, to labor, albeit in much less danger, I mean, who, who has served to the degree of Paul's danger? Much less affliction, but nevertheless, whatever your affliction, whatever your trial, whatever your danger and risk of serving, your hand is unleashed and freed for service when you have a confidence assurance and by faith you're looking ahead for the joy set before you. And that's what Paul is saying when he says, I'm still at home in this tent that's dissolving, it's decaying, and while I'm here, I'm absent for the Lord, but I'm looking at what lies beyond the grave. Now, I think Hebrews 11, where Paul gives us all of these examples, or the writer of Hebrews is using that to connect Hebrews 12 with Hebrews 10, which we heard read this morning. So the... the the people running the race in Hebrews are thinking about no longer serving. They don't want to labor anymore. They just want to go back to the easy life in Jerusalem. So they're thinking about departing from faith. So all the saints in Hebrews 11 are, are put there to show them how grace comes to them through faith and keeps them building arks, keeps them living in tents, keeps them bearing children, keeps them going by faith in great hardship. Of varying degrees. So let's test this definition in Hebrews 10, and then we're going to again apply it to our text in chapter 5. Paul would say, or the writer, if you disagree with Paul being the writer, for you had compassion on me and my bonds, for you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in heaven you have an enduring and an abiding substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of endurance or patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. All right, let's, let's apply the definition. Faith is solid, it keeps going, it's confident and assured. So what does he say? Don't throw away your confidence. What confidence? Of the future reward. It has a great recompense of reward. Why not throw it away? Because you need to endure. Substance, solid life. Why? So you can keep serving or doing the will of God. And we can see all that in Hebrews 10. Faith is the confidence of what you're hoping for. It's the confidence of heaven. You know in heaven, Paul knows in heaven, there's an enduring and an abiding body that he'll get. He knows that, so he's confident. So don't throw away your confidence, which is looking to the reward, because you need to keep serving or doing the will of God. And if you don't endure or persevere... You stop serving. Why? 
Because who ever heard about building some ark when there's no rain on the earth, right? It's just too hard. All right, there's the confident, solid portion. But listen to what else he says. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Faith is the basic inherent in feature of what you're hoping in. And what are you hoping for? Joy. Now listen, you took joyfully the, the plundering of your goods, knowing in heaven you have an enduring and an abiding substance. The evidence of what they couldn't see was seen in the proof of the plundering of their goods. Why did they just have their goods plundered and they just kept on serving? Joyfully, they took the plundering of their goods because they knew they were confident that when this body, this tent goes in the ground, I've got an eternal building. And how glorious is that going to be? Paul's confidence. His faith is seen in his labor and ministry because he's looking at something which natural eyes can't see. But he's looking by faith at the future reward that Christ purchased for him, the recompense that Hebrews says, and when he's looking at that, he keeps going. Substance, confidence, joy. What happens if he throws away his confidence of heaven And the joy set before him? What happened if Jesus would have had no joy set before him? Hypothetically, he would not have endured the cross. He would not have despised the shame. He would have moved away from it. Now we know that wasn't possible, but the writer of Hebrews tells us Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, and he's also an example of faith. He had joy set before him. He was confident in his father and what his father called him to do. And he kept right on serving when the spikes hit his hand and the thorns hit his head. He kept going in all that pain. Why? Because he was confident in his father's will. That's what Paul is saying. If we don't look at the monster death, and it's a monster, and smile at it, but we're gripped by fear and we never think about what's coming after the grave, then you never serve. And you live your life in the bubble called here and now. For what end? As much I can eat, whatever I can drink, whatever I can get for myself. Because at the end, we just go in the grave. And who knows what happens after that, so the world says. Or they come up with some kind of idea. You know, it seems like everybody that dies is justified these days. You know, all you have to do to go to heaven is just die. Because every funeral you go to, that person's in heaven. What? Well, they died, of course. But for the believer... We're looking for something to come. And no matter how good it gets here or bad it gets here, it's never going to be right, ever, until Jesus returns a second time bodily. It'll never get right completely and totally. So Paul is looking for the day where all things will be made right. Now, how does he know this? That's the next question. Have you ever talked to anybody that was raised from the dead? You ever seen that happen? No, you haven't. Now, I'm not talking about these people that get on the operating table and they say they had an out-of-body experience and went to heaven and came back and write about it? Okay, fine. Now I'm talking about the person that was eaten with sharks about a thousand years ago. Did that person come back and told you? No, resurrection's happened. Look to me, I was eaten by sharks. Or the person whose body is decayed and there's no flesh on it, just a bunch of bones in a graveyard somewhere. Or they were exploded in war somehow and their body was blown apart by some cannonball or something years ago. If you talk to that person, no, you haven't. You have never seen, you've never talked, you've never looked upon a person that was raised from the dead like that. How do you know then? Are you crazy? What are you doing here? You're pinning your whole life on something that you can't prove, you can't talk to, you can't go to somebody and say, well, here's a person that was raised. We say, well, Christ was raised. Did you see it? Did you talk to it? No, you haven't. Are you deluded? Now, that's how the world will hit you with that reality. How did Paul know? He knew from Old Testament Scripture, and he knew by revelation, and he wrote that revelation for you. Beloved, when all the props are removed, and all the things that we lean upon are no longer there, the only thing we have to rest our case on is the Word of God alone. That will make you look like a fool to the world. 
But Paul said, if any man be wise, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Be a fool. Be such a fool that you rest your case on this word with no other evidence. When the science is gone, when the archaeologist is no longer there, when the paleontologist cannot give you a clue that all these things are helpful, when nothing is left but the Word of God, we stand on God's Word and we say, we believe Scripture. Why? For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul told Timothy, this is Paul's confidence. He's walking by faith. He said, Timothy, you've known from a child the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise for salvation by faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration. Timothy, what's going to support your faith that you've known from Holy Scripture but the Holy Scripture and nothing else? Timothy, what are you to preach? Holy Scripture alone and nothing else. I mean, can't we, don't we need something to prop it up? Nothing. Your faith, Paul's faith was hanging on the Word of God. And there are fewer and fewer people that believe this today. It's vital. If you're to have this confidence about life after death, where are you going to get it? Just the Word. You can't get it from me. You haven't seen anybody. You haven't talked to anybody. Where are you going to get it? Right here alone. If we don't believe this book is inspired, we are in trouble. And Christians are in trouble today. We believe in the verbal, plenary, unlimited, infallible, inerrant inspiration of Scripture. What on earth is that? Who made that up? You know, every word was added because of error. Used to, you could just say, I believe in inspiration of Scripture. Someone comes along and says, no, no, it's the concepts that are inspired, not the words. Beloved, where do concepts come from if they don't come from words? How can you believe concepts if you don't believe the words were inspired? So we add verbal inspiration. Verbal means the words. Down to the words. The singular word. Jesus hangs His case on what He says in John 10 from the Old Testament by a single word, God's. A single word. We believe in verbal inspiration. Well, somebody comes along and says, no, wait a minute. A parts of it, but not all of it. Verbal plenary, which means the whole. You know, the plenary session at a conference is where everybody comes together, not the breakout sessions. All of it together. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's God breathed. They were moved by God and they wrote what God wanted them to write through their own personality and, and their own genre and all the ways that they were thinking. God did it. God had them write what He wanted. To the Word. If not, then... What if the building of God, a house eternal in the heavens, is inaccurate? And you're going to keep serving in affliction when you don't know if that word's accurate? You don't know if that text is really true? Because not all of it's inspired. Well, who's going to decide? Well, you can decide for yourself. Or maybe some scholar somewhere. We think this is inspired, but this is not. Verbal, plenary, infallible, inerrant. Somebody says, well, yes, but some of the words there and some of the, the statements are in error. So comes infallible, inerrant notwithstanding textual variance. That's a subject for another day. Verbal, plenary, infallible, inerrant. Well, somebody says, well, it's limited to statements about faith. You can't rely on the historical facts, so we add unlimited. Verbal, plenary, unlimited, infallible, inerrant, inspiration of the Bible. Do you believe that? If you don't, I don't know what you think is going to happen to you after death, I don't know why you think what I'm saying is true. I don't know why you don't think I made this up. Because you're looking at your Bible and you believe what the Word of God says. Paul said, we having the same spirit of faith as it is written, as it is written, graphe. We believe, therefore we speak. If we don't believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, what, why are we saying anything? Shut our mouths, Right? Paul's confidence is a walk of faith because he knows what lies ahead in the future because he's, it's been revealed to him by Jesus and he penned it and he preached it and now you have it. So your confidence can be the same as Paul's by faith even though we are not subjected to the same dangers that Paul was subjected to. Nevertheless, Paul says, we are always confident knowing that. I'm still in this tent. I'm absent from the Lord, 
but I can see eternal things. I see heaven is my home. I see there's a treasure that waits for me. I see that, therefore the conclusion, I'm laboring. Are you laboring? Or have you been distracted because of difficulties and trials in your life so you've diverted all your attention to the bubble of life and that's really where you find your joy? It's not that there's no joys in what God has created, but is that what you're aiming for? Is that sum you up? could be that you've lost confidence in the future, that you're ignoring death. You don't think about what happens to me when I die. And so Paul says, number one, in this body I'm confident because I'm walking by faith. Number two, he says in verse 8, we are confident, he's still confident, and I say, and willing rather, this is preferred over the walk of faith. Walk of faith, not bad, but this is better to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He doesn't have his body. He wouldn't at death. When Paul died, the body, they cut his head off, the body went into some kind of grave. Where did he go? Present with the Lord. Second best. Second best. Not best, but second. Paul calls this being unclothed or naked. He uses the metaphor of not living in a house or not having clothes. When you take off your clothes, if you don't have a new set, immediately you walk around the house naked. Say, Mom, if you wash my clothes, I need to get some clothes washed. So Paul says, verse 2, For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Verse 3, If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. So Paul is speaking about the disembodied soul. When the body goes into the ground, the tent goes into the ground, we are, metaphorically speaking, naked. We don't have a body. Now this helps inform us at funerals when we have awkward experiences and we talk about the deceased. You know, we say, Uncle Frank sure looks good. Well, no, he doesn't. He looks dead, right? He's just as dead as dead can be. You can't make death look good. It's a monster. Not good. Then we say, Uncle Frank must be dancing in heaven right now. Uncle Frank must be eating his favorite food. I mean, the man doesn't have feet. He can't dance. He doesn't have a mouth. He can't eat. He's a disembodied soul. You say, well, maybe the soul can dance. Maybe it can, I don't know, but it's not doing with legs. His legs are in the ground. His teeth, if he still has them, is in his body. How would you eat as a soul anyway? Where where does it enter and where does it go? There's no digestion. Now, we're talking about things that we have very limited knowledge. What Paul says, when the body goes in the grave, he's not sleeping. He's not in some intermediate state. Uh, apart from the Lord, he's not in purgatory, he's not in any place, he is with the Lord. Immediately. In the Old Testament, when the, the Bible would say the person slept with their fathers, they were talking about the body sleeping, not the soul. So Paul makes very clear the second best, I prefer not to be living by faith, which means what I prefer is being with the Lord, and what that'll mean first is I'm, I'm a disembodied soul. Now, God is a spirit and God thinks, God has emotion, God is wise, God has knowledge with no brain, as we have a brain. and No body, because Jesus put on a body who was spirit pre-incarnate. So I'm assuming then, as soul, we still think, we still know, we still love, because in the presence of God, there's joy and pleasure. And if Paul says, I'm present with the Lord, although I don't have a body, then he's experiencing some joy, some pleasure. Sin is gone, the struggle is gone, the affliction is gone, the decay is gone, but the body's still in the grave. That's the second best. Paul is confident in his walk of faith because he looks to the future. When he dies and his body's still in the grave, he dies, he's with the Lord, disembodied. But thirdly, here's the best. To be clothed upon that mortality might be gulped down and devoured by life. The ultimate end for which God created and saves is a new set of clothing and a new body that's spectacular. Again, there are some things we are not sure about concerning this body. We know there's continuity from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or 15 rather. You put a corn of wheat in the ground, and what comes up? A plant that has continuity with the seed, Right? It's not completely different, but it's different. There's continuity. So the body you put in the grave is the body that comes out. By the power whereby Jesus is able to subdue all things to Himself. 
He's going to raise bodies. Paul says that's the ultimate experience. We're in our bodies. But Paul said, really what's ultimate is to bypass the naked phase, right? If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For Paul, if he could be present when Christ came back bodily. Now this does not suggest that he thought that would happen. In fact, there's evidence to say that he didn't think that would happen. First Corinthians chapter, Thessalonians chapter 2, he said, Before the day of the Lord, before he comes back, there'll be a great falling away first, and the son of man, or son of sin, the man of perdition, will be revealed. Well, that wasn't in Paul's life. So I don't think Paul really thought Jesus could come back while I'm alive. I don't think he thought that. Furthermore, what would that be like if Jesus came back bodily just only 40 years after he died? Well, that'd be a small heaven, wouldn't it? I mean, most of the Old Testament Israelites were not saved. And then only 40 years after he died, he shows up. Well, salvation's over. That means you're not saved. You're not even here. No, I don't think Paul thought that. But Paul relished the idea. And there will be Christians that are standing on the earth that day that will never be naked. In fact, the clothes they have on, they'll just be an instantaneous transformation and they'll have on new clothes and they'll never be naked. That's ultimate. Now, we're all going there even if we're not here when the Lord comes back. But imagine what that would be like for an old man or an old woman who's walking by Cain, whose eyes are dim, whose joints are falling apart, whose back is hunched over, who's shuffling because of imbalance and older age, whose hearing is diminished, whose teeth are failing them. And then all of a sudden, instantaneously, what happens? He's given a new set of clothing in the moment, in the twinkling or a blink of an eye, before he can blink his eyes and open them. He has a new set of clothes, a body prepared by God. Beloved, if, if, if we don't look to this, it's going to hamper in some degree our labor and what we do because all we can think about is, is the moment in time we're living in. I mean, that's where the real joy is to be found. That's where the real fulfillment is when in fact it's not, is it? Oh, the disappointments, the heartaches, the broken relationships, the broken bodies, the disasters, the decays, the disease, the pain. It will never be right here, ever, until the Lord returns bodily. So Paul has confidence. He knows what lies before him. Paul has confidence, secondly, all that was under the first heading. Paul's confidence in knowing what the future holds by faith. Secondly, Paul's confidence is in verse 5. He knows what God has prepared him for. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, the guarantee of the Spirit. So Paul has a guarantee, and you do too. It's the earnest of the inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession. That's the resurrection. We have an earnest guarantee, like earnest money on a house. We will be raised. So Paul says, God has wrought, rendered us fit for the self-same thing. What thing? That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now the aorist tense suggests two things. He's done it in the past. It's usually rendered a simple past tense. <clears throat> the beginning of something, but where there's a beginning, typically there's an ongoing action. And that's the passive voice. The word earnest of the Spirit, the phrase ensures us that what God began, what He's fully rendered us fit for, He's still preparing us for glory in some way. Not that the preparation is what earns the glory. We have it. It's done. But God is fitting us. He's equipping us for the new bodies. It's like a boy that's riding a, a donkey is being trained for riding a stallion one day. A stallion. Now the question is, how is God preparing us for life in the new body? Well, Paul uses the word twice, groaning. Verse 2, for in this we groan earnestly desiring. Verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle, this tent, do groan being burdened.
A groan is an audible expression with the breath, like, and we know that means something, doesn't it? What'd you just sigh for? You're not just catching your breath, typically. There's a reason for it. In James 5, 9, the, the groaning is a grudge. That's not good. In Hebrews 13, 17, the groaning is grief. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus groans, he sighs for sympathy for the man he's going to heal. But here, Paul is groaning for glory. How is God preparing Paul for what he's already prepared for, in one sense? Through being burdened by afflictions that serve Paul to groan and to desire his eternal home. To desire riding the stallion. That all the foretaste and the first fruits of the Spirit, the earnest that we have, we know earnest means something's coming greater. And so the affliction that Paul is experiencing, which is light, is working for him a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while he's looking, while he's groaning for glory. Now, if you're young, you probably think, well, I haven't done much groaning. You will. If you're a Christian, you'll groan the right way. For the creature itself was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. God has subjected the cosmos to futility and emptiness and vanity. You'll never get there. You'll never get there in this world. He did it by design for hope-filled reasons. So you won't hope in creation. Even creation doesn't hope in itself when it's personified. The earnest expectation of the creature is waiting for your manifestation of glory. He's waiting for you. So he says, don't look at me. I can't help you. I can't fulfill you. I've just been created as vanity. Sin has affected the cosmos. There's decay, disaster, disease, pain, snake bites, wasp bites, things falling apart. You build something, it decays. How much vanity is that? God designed it that way. The sin of Adam has affected creation so that we would not hope in creation. Because the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together till now. Creation is groaning for a future like a woman in childbirth. Who out of that birth comes life. Out of the birth of creation comes a new creation. Paul says not only they but we also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we groan within ourselves. What? Waiting for the adoption to wit. This is it. The redemption of what? The body, the house the tent. See, God has first prepared us by giving us a desire for eternity, right? We haven't always desired that. He's translated us from the power of darkness to the kingdom of His dear Son. He's made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Darkness can't inherit light. You know, if you had an old rich uncle that left you an inheritance of a priceless library. You don't like books. You don't like reading. What do you do? Well, you sell it. I mean, the, the highest bidder, low bidder, who cares? Get rid of these books. But if something happened within you, all of a sudden, you have this interest in reading books. But really, not just reading books. That can be laborious sometimes. It's because every book in the library, you want to know what's in it. It's the content. What's the content of every book in the inheritance? It's Jesus. It's King Jesus. What's the content of the Bible? They are they which testify of me. Now you have this interest that you didn't have because God has wrought you for life eternally by making you equipped for the inheritance, by now giving you a longing for Him and a longing for glory. So beloved, when Paul is being afflicted and troubled and persecuted and perplexed and cast down when his afflictions, which are really, really heavy when we look at it, and dangers every day, his confidence as he knows God has wrought him and God is preparing him for life with God in eternity by increasing his groaning and his desires. We groan in this tent earnestly desiring. Why are you groaning? Because nothing is right in this world, is it? And as you live longer, you'll see the disappointments, the heartaches, the decay, the afflictions, the challenges, the broken relationships, 
the things that never go right. They're just going to continue. It's not going to stop. The government is not going to make it better. Science is not going to get rid of it. Nobody's going to conquer death, but Christ has conquered the grave. And death shall be swallowed up in victory or in life. And as we are confident that God has wrought us and He's preparing us, what's the upshot? What's the end? Paul says, Wherefore we labor, we strive, we keep going when it's hard. That whether present or absent, whether we're in the body or out of the body, we may be accepted of Him. And how are we accepted in the Beloved? Through the blood of Christ as the foundation and through faith in Christ. So we labor by faith and in His presence. How do we come before Him? Are you going to come before Jesus and say, I'd just like you to see these things I did for you. I'd like to see these works here. I think I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I've done some bad things, but not like those other guys. So I'd like you to let me in on the basis of what I've done. You'll be banished from His presence. See, whether, whether absent in the body, whether present, what pleases God is faith. So we come out, I, I rely solely. If you let me in, God, if you let me see the light of day and eternity with you, and you don't banish me from your presence forever under your wrath, it'll be because of Jesus and Jesus alone will I stand before you. Wherefore, we are always confident, wherefore we labor. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and I thank you for the hope we have in the resurrection. That Paul may have seemed like a madman beside himself. May have seemed like a man that we would say is glutton for punishment. Because every time he ministered, every day, it brought hardship and affliction. It brought danger of death. The death threats and the occasions of death that he had were numerous as he outlines in this letter. And yet he just keeps going. We know, Lord, it's by faith in future glory, by faith in the promises of your word that he believed and that we believe, by faith in scripture alone that you've inspired, by faith he knows then, as we know, Lord, that because of the blood of Christ, you will raise our bodies out of the grave. And if we come in your presence with soul alone, there we find joy and pleasure, but we await the climax of creation and of the body to enjoy you forever in perfect, new, righteous bodies in a righteous place where your name will be glorified forever as we enjoy you forever and ever. We pray, come quickly, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.